How are you, TEDx audience? Woo, that sounds great! <laughs> You're a member of TEDx audience, that sounds great. Um, I'm just checking who's here. And um, maybe you're in for a little experiment. What about that? Look around you. Who's in front of you, left, right? And ask yourself, who, whose parents in this audience, um, whose uh, who's, uh, parents of the members in the audience were the very first to attend higher education. Perhaps you're able to tell whose members in the audience um, were the first, were, the were first generation students. And a first generation student is, um, your first generation student, if neither of your parents attended higher education. So, would, be able to t would we be able to tell if, um, the parents of the person in front or left of you attended higher education, or if they didn't attend higher education. Well, we can tell, can we? No. Just by appearance alone, we wouldn't know who is a first-generation student or who isn't. And um, maybe you're actually wondering, why are we talking about this topic? How come it's important to address this topic? First-generation students, non-first-generation students, we're all equals, right? Well, international research supports that parental level of education has dramatic effects on upward social mobility. And 40% of our students are first-generation. And I tell you that first-generation students have a higher chance of dropping out of higher education. So, four out of ten students uh, at the Universities of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands are first generation. And just imagine this, the students who just started last month in September, the first generation students, half of them won't be there next year in the same class. So where did he go? One in four switches within a couple of months, within a year. They pursue a different higher education degree. But watch this. One in four students drops out of higher education permanently. So one in four, you know, and the difference with the non-first generation. The dropout rate compared to their peers with university-educated parents is 5%. So one in four first-generation students will drop out in the first year compared to one in five. And, you know, I see some people thinking, you know, one in four, one in five, that's not a major difference. Well, I'll tell you this. Every time we graduate a first-generation student, we don't only change the life of that very one student, we change the life of an entire generation, of their generation. We change the life of their family. So that's, that's very significant. I was actually very troubled when I saw these figures. All along, I thought that universities served as engines of upward social mobility. <laughs> I had the ideal of the meritocratic society, but it seems like we have to take a few more step, steps before we get there. And... Um, you can take those steps too. Are you up for it? All right, that's good. During this talk, I want to provide a lens. I want to provide a pair of glasses to look at this problem differently. So we don't only think about dropout rates when we think about these students. We see the qualities they have. And the reason why I know what, the qual what qualities they have is because I initiated this bottom-up change. We create this research project, we created this intervention, a summer bridge transition program to give students a soft landing into higher education and a flying start into the new year. And it has dramatic effects on how we feel about these students. We can, could finally see their faces and hear their voices. All right. 
Maybe you're wondering, so what are the struggles first-generation students experience because they drop out? What's going on here? Well, non-first-generation students arrive at the gates of higher education with the tools of the trade. They, they, they learn the tools of the trade from family members. You know, what dispositions, um, habits, um, practices, codes, conducts are the norm here. They were shown the ropes, so to say. And it helps them to crack the college code. It helps them to navigate higher education more smoothly. So what if you're not familiar with the rules of the game? If you're a first-generation student, well, then it feels you're you know, ahead of the game. And I, I experienced this firsthand. You know, you, you don't have all the resources and you don't have a social support network that, that smooths the transition. So, without the insights, the inner knowledge about the inner workings of academia, first-generation students actually struggle, and they struggle to understand the different roles and expectations of faculty and students. In that sense, students with university-educated parents arrive here on campus with an invisible toolkit, with passports, codes, dictionaries, and tools. Actually, first-generation students arrive here with a disadvantage, and they can drop further behind if policies and practices in higher education reinforce rather than reduce this opportunity gap, because that's what we're talking about. And I thought, how can we provide, provide them uh, this opportunity? And I know we have this diversity on campus. Um, we do, 40% of students are first generation. Uh, but inclusion goes beyond viewing diversity as mere numerical representation of diverse groups. Inclusion stands for a measure of institutional culture that enables diversity to thrive. Would you like first-generation students to survive, just to survive, or to thrive? To thrive, okay, I'm glad you're with me. Well, that's what I wanted to So we designed this program and it's called Tune In. And um, what made us really sort of get this thing going, we saw this phrase, diversity is being invited to the party and um, div in in inclusion is being invited to dance. So I thought, okay, I like a party, uh, I like to dance. I mean, we're going to throw a party for first-generation students, a.k.a. we designed an evidence-informed and evidence-based summer bridge transition program, an empowerment program. And, um, yeah, I, I've never seen something like this before here on campus. It was really like a grassroots mo uh, movement, and everybody joined teachers, trainers, um, and... Um, well, now I'm getting a little bit over excited. I mean, let's be very honest. To, to, to create that change, it was actually a little bit difficult. Because, remember, you don't know who's a first-generation student? Well, actually, the university doesn't know. We don't systematically gather that data once a student enrolls. Um, so we wanted to design targeted support. But there was no history of outreaching these students. And what other people told me is like, Oh, we don't do targeted support. Let's just do this program for everybody. And I realized that there was actually a fear to stigmatize or marginalize these students. We didn't have the right language to think about these students. There was some kind of stigma going on, talking about parental level of education or talking about inequalities in higher education. And I thought, okay, the university should be rallying around the needs of all students. Because we have different programs for students with disabilities and special needs. We have a program for students that um, play top sports. And those students 
who play top sports is just 2% of the entire student body of the Universities of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. And we're talking 40% here. So there I was. I was like, okay, I'm going to drive this change. Um, but what I didn't realize is that, you know, to, to, to change the system, you have to change mindsets. Um, and you have to take on a certain level of vulnerability and, and risk. To, to step up your game and just, you know, get this thing going, uh, especially when it's very new for an organization. Nobody really likes change. Um, so, yeah, there's actually a fine line between a troublemaker and a change maker. I can tell you that it's really nice to stand on the spot and to feel like a change maker. But, you know, I, I, I really uh, did at some times feel like a troublemaker. So everybody out there who's rooting for certain groups of students at some point, it'll get, uh, it'll get better. Um, and, um, yeah, what was going on with that, that quest for the, you know, the mindset to think about these students differently? Well, just to, to, I just want to use this metaphor. Maybe you've seen it before. It's about sameness and justice um, or fairness. And sameness is about giving everybody the same amount, everybody the same thing. Uh, however, uh, this equality approach doesn't really work if you start with an unequal, like, if you start with inequality to start with, it's not likely to improve inequality if you have an equality approach. So what about equity, fairness? You would suppose what educational professional wouldn't um, want to have a fair opportunity for first-generation students? Well, the thing is, when you're working in an interdisciplinary team like TuneIn, you know, with communication professionals, researchers, lecturers, teachers, students, policymakers, it's hard to define what is fair treatment. What people perceive as fair differs greatly. What I find troubling from this picture, if we're talking about somebody's height, you know, give the short guy some extra boxes, no problem. But if we use this paradigm to think about first-generation students, it comes across as if they're inherently less capable. Uh, we're focusing on, on how under-resourced they are. So this, this deficit approach uh, focuses on remedial support to address student weaknesses. And I understand that, you know, with its deficit, deficit approach in mind, you have no case. I can understand you fear to marginalize when you, you know, put that idea across. So, I have a better idea. I would like you to take home another metaphor. If we're talking specifically about the situation of first-generation students. So, here you can see an Olympic track. Yes. So can you imagine if the long distance runners would all have to start at the same line? Everybody in the same position, please. What would happen? The runners in the outer lanes would have to run further than the runners in the inner lanes because of the semicircles of the track. So something that would initially come across as fair, no, yes, no, it's fair, it's very equal, is actually not fair. So equity leads us to stagger the starting positions. Yes, you stagger the positions according to each lane. So everybody runs the same distance. And I find this racetrack metaphor helpful to critically examine higher education um, institutional structures that sometimes, even with the best intentions, there are barriers that could have a bad effect on some and others don't really notice anything. So actually we're giving students, uh, first generation students, a staggered start. They start in the summer. Nobody's gonna get harmed by that. And we had a great time in August when those students arrived here, because we now had the words. We used an asset-based approach. Of course, we know what our struggles are. You know, I'm a researcher, I know. But we're not focusing on the struggles. We're creating environments where the strongest qualities of the students um, are identified, 
understood and nurtured, what about that? And it strengthens their student agency, how to advocate for themselves, how to ask help, how to get involved in extracurricular activities, you know, how to build their social networks. And we're in the middle of the analysis of the research, and it will be boring to show you any graphs. So just some quotes. How did the students look at themselves after they participated in a program? They feel like a pioneer. Or as a guide. So we, we, we use this different paradigm to think about these students, hence they also feel empowered. I'm proud to be a trailblazer. Tune in made me realize that, you know, they paved the road. That sounds much better than this problem deficit approach. The diversity we bring to campus is celebrated, not just accepted. I love that. The idea, you're, you know, it's a celebration, and, and it was, absolutely. And this is a quote from a board member. So this whole positivity, this empowerment spread through the university. Now we're looking at them and we're thinking they're frontier explorers. Hey, and we applaud them. And we hear their stories and we are made aware of their ambition and resilience. Because some students came from overseas, Suriname, Dutch Caribbean islands, but some literally crossed the sea are refugee students. And if you hear their stories, you can draw qualities out of their stories. Tenacity, grit, perseverance, all the qualities you need to make it in the first year or beyond to get your bachelor's degree. And sometimes people tell me, are you pampering those students holding their hands the entire first year? No, we don't. And also a board member knew that and told a journalist, we have high expectations, we're giving them an initial leg up an initial leg up, and we say, go for it. You can do it. I think we should have more role models. I think we should make ourselves more visible if we're a first-generation student, if we, if we were. Like Michelle Obama. She's very active in that field. Role models are very important. You know, because if they tell their story, the experiences of the current first-generation students are validated. You are capable. You just need to figure this whole thing out. And what about Kristalina Georgieva? She narrates her story that she was born in a small town in Bulgaria and how she became the CEO of a World Bank. And those stories, the storytelling, the role modeling, the inspirational stories and experiences of, for example, first-generation graduates we use in the program. So um, everybody gets empowered. Um, everybody has a chance to express their voice. And you know, we advocate for first generation students. So we can create a ripple effect by just simply using one tiny pebble. We don't need a brick to create a ripple effect. And inclusive education, um, can be realized if it's a collective effort. Inclusive education is everybody's business, not just mine. So please, don't leave your pebbles unused. Make the change so the word change maker can apply to all of us.